Thank you for tuning in to our JSA Virtual Roundtable, Shaking Down the Digital Divide, Rural Broadband Access Across North America. Just a couple of housekeeping notes before we begin. Our first 100 registrants today have now received lunch delivered to their door or a gift card. So please go ahead and enjoy. We have well over 330 registrants today. Our big round table. So yeah, very exciting. Go ahead and emoji that. <laughs> so if you weren't one of our first, that's okay. And that's about two thirds of y'all. So hopefully next time, make sure, hint, uh, these are monthly. Check out jsa.net for future topics and register early so we can feed you. I'm an Italian mom. I want to feed you all. So uh, go ahead and register early and, uh, and we'll get some, some lunches sent to your door. Also, as you probably noticed, our JSA Virtual Roundtables got a bit of a facelift this 2021. Includes a first in the industry virtual network networking lounge before and after our panel discussion. So please stick around once this roundtable concludes to join the tables for a unique opportunity to talk face to face with other event attendees and speakers. And go ahead, table hop. You know, go ahead and keep that conversation going. We really want to see you, hear from you face to face. Also, during this panel, we also want to hear from you. Make this experience interactive as possible. So please go ahead and add any questions that you may have for our panelists into the chat, or you can request the mic to come on camera and ask your question to the panelists. Uh, so feel free. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. You're not here to hear me talk, you're here to hear uh, the gentlemen that we have lined up here. Our topic today, incredibly timely, shaking down the digital divide, rural broadband access across North America. To introduce our speakers and to right, please welcome my good friend, my love him, Rob Powell, founder and chief editor of Telecom Ramblings, the blog you must be reading every morning like I am. Rob, thanks for joining us today, my friend. The floor is yours. Thank you, Jamie. And thank you for the invitation to, to moderate today's panel. Uh, it, it's no secret that urban and suburban areas get most of our industry's infrastructure love. And it's always been kind of a struggle to balance broadband access needs of rural areas against the cost of deployment. The FCC's Rural Digital Opportunity Fund is directing up to $30 billion over 10 years on infrastructure projects that will go through a formal bidding process. The, these projects must be meticulously planned as they are expected to begin immediately upon approval without the delay. So how do you ensure that you have all that you need and ready at a moment's notice? Our panel of experts here will uh, share their ex valuable expertise and insights as to how you can prepare. But first, let's quickly meet our panelists. We have, uh, I'll introduce each one and uh, give them a chance to to, to tell what what where they come from and what you know what what their point of view is going to be from, uh, we have uh, Rob Custer, the senior vice president of uh, product management at Consolidated. Rob, tell tell us a bit about yourself. Hey Rob, thanks for having me today. Um, so work for Consolidated Communications. Um, we're a, a multi services telecom operator um, with twenty three states, twenty three state service area, residential, um, commercial, enterprise, and, and carrier space. So um, our off and broadband expansion expansion is kind of in our DNA and, and what we do. So look at the conversation today. Thanks. We have Scott Bergs, uh, President and CEO of EX Squared Technology. Scott. Hi, thanks again uh, for having me on board and, and welcome to everybody who's joined the, the panel as well as the audience here. Uh, really excited here again, Scott Bergs. I'm the CEO of Vivacity in our, in our operating company, EX Squared Technology, and we design, build, operate, and maintain carrier neutral wholesale access fiber facilities uh, and related assets to help enable the expansion of broadband uh, in urban and in rural markets. And I've spent the better part of the last embarrassingly 30 plus years uh, building out in those areas, much of that specifically in those tier two and tier three markets that the 96 Communi Communication Act had envisioned would come into parallel with service operated, uh, offered in the metro areas. So excited about this and in the, in the panel here today. Thanks. Uh, we have Frank DeJoy, uh, Vice President of Network Development at Render Networks. Frank. Well, thank you, Rob, and welcome to all the participants and panelists. Um, again, I'm uh, Frank DeJoy, Vice President, Network Deployment at Render Networks. We're a construction management company and our platform streamlines the construction process for major fiber and wireless network deployments. We use digital transformation, automation, 
geospatial data and mobile technology uh, for uh, deployment projects, including uh, programs like RDOF, CAF2, other rural uh, broadband programs. We've been operating for close to nine years in Australia, the United States, uh, now the UK. I've been in the industry 30 years uh, at uh, executive network roles, AT&T, uh, General Dynamics, DICOM, uh, and Quanta. And at Render, I'm responsible for North American market development and deployments. Thank you. Thanks. We have uh, Isak Mian, uh, VP of Sales and Support Engineering at Redline Communications. Isak? Hi. So um, thanks for having me and welcome everyone for joining this session. So um, um, I'm the VP um, here uh, at Redline Communication. We are a North American manufacturer of uh, wireless communication systems. Um, uh, multiple technologies includes private uh, LTE as well as um, uh, fixed wireless um, um, and soon. 5G. Um, um, I've uh, been with Redline for about a um, year or so, but the company has been around for more than two decades, um, uh, providing uh, reliable, low latency um, communication, wireless communication systems to various industries across the globe. Um, uh, and we do manufacture our, uh, our products here in North America. Um, um, I personally, um, uh, you know, come from a telecom background, but providing the service to critical industries. Um, have been in the industry for um, about close to 27, 28 years, uh, 20 years of which has been under Crown Corporation. So working with regulatory bodies um, and, and doing that extra due diligence to plan projects like these is, is a particular forte of mine. I'm all a doctorate candidate at uh, the George Washington University, um, where the focus of my research is project planning, specifically uh, managing risks in uh, infrastructure projects like these, uh, which is the topic of today. Uh, so looking forward to this roundtable discussion. Thanks. And finally, we have uh, Steve Levitt, Vice President of Global Ecosystem Development at Connected to Fiber. Steve? I well, appreciate the chance to be here. So Connected to Fiber has built the Connected World, which is the industry SaaS built specifically for uh, the connectivity industry and has one goal. It's to how do we transform the planning, buying, and selling of network um, amongst a, a very active ecosystem. So I appreciate the chance to be here and participating in the topic. Thanks. So let's get into it here. Let's start off with the basics here. What are rural access projects like? So are they all similar? Is there a, a wide spectrum? What what types of opportunities does a program like RDOF enable for you? Can you give us a, if you can, and a, a specific example of what such a project look for you? Let's start off with Rob over at Consolidated. Rob? Yeah, Rob, I, you know, I think they, in some respects, the projects are really similar, but they're also really diverse. So you use our example. Um, I think it's fairly representative for the, some of the larger operators. We do serve 23 states. So the, the needs of the individual communities and the, and the geographies kind of vary pretty broadly. We, see, uh, we saw RDOF really as a jumping off point. Um, you know, we had identified thousands of locations that we would be able to build to and drop fiber off to as we went after specific RDOF census blocks. Um, you know, one example of that, Stonington, Maine. Um, the city of Stonington, Maine is, is a pretty rural location. It's about a thousand, uh, a thousand locations to serve the entire town, not only the, the city core, but also the more rural locations. Um, so we're able to use RDOF to fill in gaps that we can then use to, to jump off to build the rest of the network. So um, between public-private partnership, private investment, and RDOF all combined, we're going to cover 100% of the locations. And that's one example of many. So as we approached RDOF, it really was, how do we use that to accelerate our larger fiber overbill plan? And, and as an adjunct to our lar larger over fiber overbill program, to drive more into the rural locations, um, which again, just, just expands opportunity for us. Um, you know, we've done a lot of public-private partnerships over the last few years, and we have many, many more of those coming. So we, we really, uh, even though we look at RDOF as, it's not fi you know, fiber is fiber is fiber, um, it also gives us the ability to um, accelerate discussions about public-private partnerships to pick up er other areas where RDOF are covered. So, um, it, it, the, the more granular we could get in our RDOF planning, the better off we're, uh, the, we knew we could be at the end of this as we start into the builds. Hmm. Interesting. Frank, you got something? Uh, yeah, I'd like to um, 
I, I guess I, I agree that there are a lot of similarities uh, as well as well as as differences, right? I mean, there's a, a wide spectrum of, of broadband funded projects that have a common theme, theme rather, of providing connectivity to uh, unserved or underserved uh, communities. You know, RDOF, right? S s you know, is a a rural program paid over you know 10 years uh, based on census blocks but other rural programs are, are more targeted with or with even broader ob objectives right you have for example the um you know american rescue plan which allocated seven billion uh for for schools and libraries uh through the e-rate program for broadband infrastructure during the pr pandemic and then you have the 2020 CARES Act that had billions that states and, and local and tribal governments could use, including for a, a portion of that for telecom, but those were targeted for completion, you know, within within the calendar year. So, diff, you know, and then, and then of course state state and local the states have uh, many different programs and the hundreds of millions over various time horizons, and there's new legislation in in congress you know as as part of president biden's you know tr multi trillion dollar american jobs plan so a lot of different programs all with the goal of advancing um you know rural rural broadband um of course rdof being uh you know center stage uh with a, a census block uh proliferation goal uh, for under and unserved, uh, you know, communities. And just that if I look at, at the, the winners, you know, such as consolidated, you know, the, the main goal, what they have in common is getting, getting broadband and future proof broadband to the, to the communities, but there are different sorts of, of operators providing that, that broadband. You've got in, incumbent telcos, um, or co-ops, uh, fixed wireless operators, um, and and even you know a new a new uh, entrant of satellite pr providers, you know, getting getting into the game. So a, a different you know a, a diverse mix of of operators, all pr all providing broadband one way or another, but with a fiber backbone as as sort of a, a common denominator. Hmm. Ishak, do you have anything over at Redline? What are you guys working on? Um, yeah, sure. So, uh, you know, as as I mentioned, we are a wireless uh, communication system manufacturer. So, um, uh, our engagement in 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 bridging the uh, sort of uh, uh, rural digital uh, divide has been, um, you know, based on that technology. Uh, but I, uh, you know. Answering this question, I agree with the panel that there are similarities, but that is if we look at it from a, a needs perspective, you know, so uh, the uh, bridging the digital divide. Uh, yes, each project is similar because that is the end goal. Uh, but if you look at it from a project management perspective or a technology perspective, then each project is unique. Um, you know, we know from a project management perspective that each project has its own uh, budget, its own schedule, um, uh, you know, and uh, each organization is different, each county, each municipality, any, uh, every stakeholder uh, is going to be different, their capabilities are going to be different. Um, the communication needs are going to be different and the communication um, um, ability available is going to be different. So each project is going to be different from that perspective. Uh, even from technology perspective, uh, you know, we have digital divide uh, in New York City and then we have have a digital divide in Tennessee or Missouri or you know uh, places like these where the uh, uh, topology the geography is completely different the population density is completely different so um, you know um, I know when it comes to uh, for example bandwidth um, or, or latency um, you know uh, uh, fiber is the way to go uh, but then um, you know these are public funds so we have to do our due diligence and um, the cost effectiveness is a 
the key, key criteria uh, um, if, where you know in, in some cases a specific technology can become really cost prohibitive which is where wireless comes into play uh, and then even in wireless uh, you know uh, in in some cases depending on the organization capability and the geography uh, you know a private LTE system might make sense versus in other cases uh, layer two fixed wireless system might make sense so each project is going to be uh, um, uh, unique and you know i'll sum it up by saying that there is no uh, uh, one solution uh, uh, that is best to bridge digital divide there's always a best fit solution uh, that is going to bridge this divide for your for any community out there hmm. scott where does the x squared fit in you're still muted I just got off. You'd think after nine months we'd uh, or a year, we'd be able to uh, figure out the mute button on these. Sorry about that. So I, I very much want to echo a lot of the things that have been said already, uh, but I won't repeat them. I think the key is we try to take an approach that does look at what's best for individual market and the individual project that we're working on. And that generally speaks to what is the goal. Uh, and if the goal on RDOF specifically is to is to provide the the bandwidth at the minimum speeds available, uh, or, or articulate it for the specific census blocks uh, as it has been. The thing that we try to do is, is do that in the most efficient way possible. So if we're dividing, if, if we're focused on a fiber network, for example, um, it, then we might put in a solution that isn't the most efficient for a particular community. So I'll, I'll echo what uh, Isak said. I think in the long run, you wanna get the, the most future-proofed facility put into place uh, that you possibly can with the timeline and the budget that's available. And as a result, you got to be a little bit flexible and you got to be a little bit specific to each different market. But having the expertise from the design and engineering perspective uh, involved in the planning process that gives you options to be able to pick from that, that then I'd say the last piece, you've got to break it down into the different components for each different market. One is the last mile, and you might have one technology that's the best technology for last mile. Then you've got to have the durability for the local market connectivity, whether that's a localized ring um, or, or a wholesale transport facility. And then ultimately, you've got to have the interconnection to the content, because without that combination of interconnection and the actual content that's going to be uploaded and downloaded to the end facility, you can have the best facilities at the end that you probably want and they won't be able to be served. So thinking about the specific technology application and the costs required to be able to deploy within the timeline articulated at each of those three layers is just critically important and, and we hope to help to do that with all the folks that we're working with and partnering with. Okay. So how does one go about winning an RDOF award to make the, make one of these projects happen? Who do you have to bring into the process? How much effort does it take? Uh, is it like a shotgun approach or, or you know, a rifle shot at a specific opportunity? Um, you know, how does one go about this? Let, let's start off with uh, um, Steve. Sure. Um, no, so connected to fibers role in RDOF is really, it's, it's about enablement. How do we um, enable our carrier partners with a combination of data and technology to inject into that planning process up front? Um, and when you think about technology platforms um, like Connect the World, you're talking about the elimination of manual processes, data silos. It brings all the information together so that all the different constituents across the organization that are participating in this have the right data elements at their disposal to create, you know, one, identify the right locations to bid on, but two, as you put that bid together, put yourselves in a position to bid on the deals where you have, you know, the most opportunity to win. Um, you know, when I think about, you know, stack ranking of, of different, um, different markets, being able to do that at scale so you can parallel process multiple markets at the same time, you know, looking at the market opportunity, but the potential challenges is in terms of what may come up of the building process, like things like right of way and things. And also, you know, triangulating that with your cost basis in terms of, you know, per foot cost, it's the ability to build not only to bid, but bid to win. And, you know, to me, that gives you, it kind of gives you the rifle-like precision with a shotgun type scale at the same time. Interesting. Uh, is that You're on mute. 
yeah, I apologize for that. Um, uh, yeah, again, I, uh, you know, from my perspective, um, you know, it, it the the recommendation is all always going to be take that very specific, uh, you know, um, uh, the rifle approach, as you mentioned. Um, uh, you know, look at your specific uh, uh, capabilities, needs, um, as I mentioned earlier, your geography, um, and then based on that, you go and uh, bid for specific opportunities, and you go and um, um, you know approach it that way. Uh, the the key thing remember is um, you know you have to invest in planning upfront. We know that um, you know these are uh, ICT projects, so information and communication technology projects. You know the the failure uh, in these projects is is higher um, uh, than other types of infrastructure projects. Uh, so planning. Again, research has suggested that uh, planning, specifically planning for risk management, for example, uh, improves the chance of success in these projects. Uh, so uh, bring in those experts um, early on, as early as possible. Talk to uh, potential vendors um, you know, early on. Uh, do your due diligence um, and plan as much as you can, as early as you can, uh, to make sure uh, you plan for the, that risk management and you have have a, a, a sort of a, a robust project plan in place uh, uh, when you go after such opportunities. Uh, Rob, how about you? What do you guys do? Yeah, to echo a lot of the a lot of the things that, that everybody said before. You know, from our perspective, we already had pretty significant fiber projects underway, and everything that we that we won in RDOF was all fiber to the home, one gig. Um, so it really was an extension of the existing strategy. When it, it was uh, it was a really targeted approach on RDOF specifically because we already had a, a like I said a pretty significant fiber bill happening, so we were really focused on where we could go with RDOF to maximize the total number of passings and get as many rural subscribers turned up as possible. The one thing I would probably add is um, you know you can't underestimate the supplier perspective of this. Um, anybody that's that's trying to deploy fiber right now is dealing with delays and enclosures and fiber. You know all of the pieces and parts that go with that, COVID-related and also just volume-related, as the industry, the manufacturing industry, tries to catch up with the massive demand. So one of the things that we started early on in our larger fiber builds and just extended the the pattern with our dog was working with the suppliers early on to give them five, seven, ten-year views into what these build plans look like, and you know talking about millions of feet of fiber per month. So that's one of the real keys is getting the suppliers in the boat as early as possible giving them full transparency to the build plan so they can start ramping up production, not just now. I mean, we're, we're already ordering fiber into 2022 and 2023 in order to make sure we have those uh, have those facilities for us when they're ready to be used. Hmm. Scott? Yeah, the thing I'd add is don't be afraid to, to say this market is not a market where we are designed to be the best. Um, or position to be the best. There's nothing worse than being the dog that caught the bus and then get wrapped around the axle. And there are certainly opportunities in art as, uh, as we've seen in, in earlier government funded projects like the BTOP projects where someone found a strategy to win the bid, but once they actually put that into uh, to execution and went out and, and either in the construction process found that that the project wasn't as well crafted or designed through the engineering and the design process up front, or they they missed a piece of either operations um, execution uh, cost or expense, or even just market uh, uh, market assumptions about what revenue is going to be able to generate it fr from those markets. So once you get the government dollars, uh, you find, oh shoot, I, I, I got something and it isn't quite as, a, as, as attractive as I, as I wanted. And then the worst case scenario is you've got sort of half built or, or underutilized infrastructure that's stranded out in, in one of these more rural markets. And, and, and now we've, we've wasted time, we've wasted money, and ultimately we haven't, we haven't achieved the underlying expansion of broadband into those markets that we hoped that we would would with those valuable uh, combination of, of private and public. Hmm. What about Frank? Uh, yeah, I, I, I agree with the um, focused approach and um, also especially Rob's uh, comments about thinking about delivery and, and materials and the team up front. I mean, it's a, it's a very competitive and involved 
process and it's not something to be uh, taken lightly, it involves a lot of resources. I want to be very, very prepared before the application uh, window window opens and, and have confidence in your solution up front um, when you're submitting your bid and be able to prove its viability and your team's uh, ability to, to deliver. Right? The RDOF program had had two stages, short form, long form, each requiring deeper levels of, of diligence about experience, solvency, capabilities. And even after the second phase, there are there challenges, you know, happening in, in the industry about some of the, the long, you know, the long form winners. So, you know, I'd, I'd say sort of the keys keys to success are, you know, the focus on, on preparation, understanding the process and requirements and detail to, to get through them properly and, you know, not missing in on any technicalities. Ensuring you have the confidence in your solution, ability to d deliver, including your team and partners and ability um, and tools to monitor progress and manage risk and, and be self-aware, understand what you can and can't do and, and, and be able to fill those gaps with the right partners and tools. Great. So once you've won one of these awards or, 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 or won part of one or whatever, uh, in what ways is the implementation of a project different from the normal course of business? And how, how do you prepare to, to, to hit the ground running and keep things on schedule once you do? Uh, let's try Scott first. Yeah, I mean, obviously we've got art off as well as earlier programs that are that are like it in the CAP two and and uh, and before that the PTAP have, have deployment objectives and it's similar. Live background is in the wireless space, and when you acquire uh, wireless licenses, there's build out requirements, and those are those are with a good purpose intended to. to uh, to ensure that people aren't just squatting on these dollars and or these rights and they're ultimately achieving uh, the expansion of the broadband facilities in a timely basis. But at the same time, they're not how you would ordinarily plan them absent that kind of arbitrary outside pressure, where in those cases, you might be looking to deploy uh, first on a on, on an organic base within a cluster to ensure that you're edging out as opposed to jumping to uh, a location to get uh, things deployed to meet an underlying coverage deadline. Um, and, and so you have to manage that deployment process to ensure that you live within the deployment requirements of RDOF um, while at the same time achieving a commercial progression of the network expansion that allows you to get some of those interim uh, returns along the way. Worst thing that can happen again is you get these federal dollars and, uh, and, and you think you're, you're off and running and then you find out midstream that you're short uh, because you didn't achieve the commercial scale that, that you needed to make the project successful long term. And, and so um, you just have to balance those up front. They're well-intentioned headlines. Uh, and deployment requirements, um, but they just need to be put into more practical. Mm, thanks. Steve, well, how do you see the implementation of these things? Yeah, just to kind of second one of Scott's, um, you know, I think being able to, to try to predict the commercial feasibility of the build out up front by looking at, you know, passes in terms of residential versus commercial versus tower infrastructure, et cetera, uh, is, a, is a real key component to pulling the right data together. And that's uh, ultimately how you bid on projects that you have a palatable, you know, amount of risk associated with it. Because, you know, with the with the government contribution, you know, you've got less margin for error, you know, missed times are not necessarily acceptable, um, you know, but it's, it's really, you know, it's getting in front of it with the right elements of data to make the right calls so that you can at least, you're never gonna you know, eliminate it, but at least get in front of the risk as much as humanly possible. Um, and, and and to do that down to the location level, understanding the, the rule of census block, but ultimately it's the people in the homes and the buildings that are in the structures that are actually gonna be consuming this network. And being able to triangulate that with any potential obstacle, getting into the actual structure and building into the structure, um, you know, those are the types of level of details. If you can homogenize that data into a single repository, it gives you this system of record to not only manage the planning piece, but the ongoing as building it out 
to to manage any of the lefts and rights that may present themselves throughout the process. And then ultimately, once it's done, how do you present that to the market and really start to monetize it? Isak, what about you? What do you see annotation? Um, so uh, a couple of ways that I, you know, uh, see it differently. Uh, number one, uh, you know, this is about bridging the rural, rural divide, uh, you know, something that we should never forget. So there's, uh, there's an obligation uh, on every stakeholder uh, uh, to remember that this is about public service. Um, you know, what that does then um, is sort of take that um, cost effective things like cost effective when we talk about due diligence when we talk about you know uh, care about caring about the people who actually will be using these networks you know at the end of the day public funds um, it's all about cost effectiveness and when i say cost effectiveness that does not mean low cost that does not mean cheap no it means achieving a balance between system effectiveness which is the function that we expect the system, whether it's fiber-based or wireless communication or whatever connectivity platform we use. It's, it's an ensuring that that system performs a desired function, um, you know, the, the uh, achieving the bandwidth and the latency uh, uh, requirements that have been defined and balancing that against the life cycle costs. And, and it's important to remember that that's the life cycle cost. This is about initial cost of procurement. It is about the uh, cost of that system across its life cycle. So it, it, that includes the planning piece, that includes the network building piece, that includes the network operations piece. And, you know, there then, you know, thinking about, okay, who's going to maintain this infrastructure? Who has the capability to do it? Uh, what kind of investment is needed or what kind of technologies um, should be selected up front to minimize the impact on the operations organizations? These are kinds of the decisions that uh, you know, take precedence uh, when it comes to planning for these projects. Uh, so you know, that is one way uh, that I'd say it's different than other. The other is, of course, as I alluded to it earlier, is risk management. Uh, you know, as I mentioned, uh, when it comes to uh, public private, um, you know, infrastructure projects, you know, the, the, the success rate has been mixed. And what research has shown that, um, you know, uh, planning for managing risk in these kind of projects uh, significantly improves, pro improves project success, chances of project success. So that is another area where there needs to be uh, uh, some, uh, you know, uh, thought that need to go into it uh, at the early stage of the project. Interesting. Rob, what about you guys? How do you go about implementing these and, and you know, how, how does it differ? Yeah, you know, for us, the, the implementation really actually began during the business. Um, so I think I referenced before, we've got a pretty significant fiber overbuild that's that's been going on for a while now and will go on for the next five or six years. Um, by 2025-ish, we're going to have more than 70% of our 2.8 million passings fiber to the home one gig capable. So when we bid RDOF, it really was centered around that specific strategy. So we intentionally picked areas that were along existing fiber routes. So in practice, what that really means for our engineering and planning teams is if I'm laying fiber across this road already, and you know, in a lot of cases, we're, we're blessed to have a pretty robust and, and dense fiber network, um, backbone fiber network, particularly in our, our Northern New England markets and in, in the other markets as well. So cost per passing is relatively pretty low. Um, so what we're able to do is over that overlay hard off to that existing plan and know we're already going down this road and we're going to drop off pond, uh, uh, XGS pond to each one of the homes and businesses and facilitate cell towers that are there already. Now we have an RDOF census block. We're going to lateral out and go build to that RDOF census block. So for us, it, it really was in a lot of cases, business as usual, just extending out the existing fiber bill plan. Yeah. And, and Frank, I'm hearing preparation is everything. Is it for you guys too? You see that? Yeah, I mean, as as I have said, I mean, and thinking about implementation and schedule with with RDOF differences with RDOF, for example, are there are specific um, requirements for getting the number of locations in the census block. Uh, deployed within uh, certain periods of time, 40% of the locations in three years, for example, then 20% in, in successive years. So those need to be important uh, fundamental milestones in the build plan. 
that would be balanced against uh, an operator's other other deployment milestones. Those the, that that objective may not be balancing, may not be driving a build plan in other densely populated areas where you're looking to get maximum you know ret return on investment. Uh, RDOF also has very specific and, and comprehensive you know re reporting requirements in, in the hub tool, you know, about different milestones and dashboard, you know, dashboard, uh, you know, uh, data that's needed both during and, and after the build, you know, and, and failure to meet the, these requirements could result in, you know, even increased reporting obligation and, and possible withholding, you know, of, of support. So my, my, you know, my takeaways are, you know, ensure your your deployment tools give give you the right visibility so that you can see your progress against your delivery, have the right leading indicators to manage risk and the right levers to adjust and, and mitigate that risk. Consider your reporting requirements up front so that you, you can automate as much as possible and focus on your deployment and operation and, and streamline and automate as much of the construction management as you can with a digital deployment approach, uh, with with tools such as that, which Render could could provide, and I'd be glad to discuss that offline. Great. All right. Uh, for, for all the panel, what what are the pitfalls that you see companies fall into in, on, on on this type type of project? When things go wrong, what where what goes wrong? Uh, let, let's start with Rob. Um, where to start the list? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, it, it, uh, I, I'm reminded that um, the more things change, the more they stay the same. I'm sure that from, if there are operators that are listening in this, we all get the same questions. Um, I got one earlier today. I had a customer say, hey, I have fiber. Your fiber is running in my, in my backyard. How do I get fiber to the home? Well, it's not that simple. Um, yeah. And I think that the masses don't understand that building fiber networks is really hard and it's terribly expensive. Um, and maintaining them to the previous comment is is just as hard and just as expensive. So, um, you know, I think there are all kinds of pitfalls. And number one is planning, right? And, and you've heard that word over and over and over and over again. Um, yeah, we've got seven to 10 years with the milestones to build these projects. But um, if you haven't started already, you need to start now. Like today, it's not too late to start planning all of your RDOF builds um, from, supply, from suppliers and, and getting fiber in. Um, getting enclosures to in home, right? CPE to get ONTs and gateways. There are so many pieces and parts, um, and that completely um, is separate from construction planning, permitting right away. Um, there, there is not uh, an early time, to, too early of a time to start. So, um, again, I think it kind of goes down to planning eliminates a lot of the risk. It's impossible to completely de-risk de fiber builds of these natures. Or, or of this nature, um, the pitfalls are out there, but it's all about planning. Um, if you know your network and you know your geography, you're really, a, you have a, a big leg up, but it still does not um, uh, obviate the need to have all of the plan in place now. Hmm. Hey, Sak, what problems do you see people run into? Um, I'll start with saying exactly the same. Um, even though the technology that we deal with is different, you know, a wireless communication as opposed to uh, wireline or fiber, um, uh, but it's exactly the same. Uh, invest in planning. If you haven't started already, uh, start today. Um, you know, uh, I'll give you a couple of specific examples. You know, uh, we've had uh, a project specifically to bridge rural divide um, in US and even here in Canada as well, um, where one common theme. Uh, when it comes to that uh, um, lack of planning comes, you know, uh, is uh, that is evident is uh, things like, uh, you know, uh, RF design, so radio frequency uh, uh, design, you know, radio frequency or wireless communication, uh, of course, just the physics of the technology is such that, uh, you know, every single uh, tree, every single building, you know, anything in that geography uh, makes a difference. It impacts the design. Um, you know, so what we've seen a lot of times is, is uh, you know, our clients coming to us with of, with this sort of understanding that it's just a matter of just like at home, you know, I, I, I buy a Wi-Fi router and I install it and, and that's it. It's, it's plug and play. 
well, modern technology is plug and play, but if you've planned properly for it. Um, so, so that, uh, you know, uh, the specific example would be that of, you know, uh, not thinking about investing in RF planning, which has a cost associated to it. Uh, you need to invest in it at times, you know, depending on the geography, high resolution data might be required and there is a cost associated. With it. So these costs needs to be budgeted for or whatever budget you have available, um, you have to allocate a part of it to these kind of services another is is sort of this the at times we've seen this reluctance of uh, investing in project management and coordination uh, you know there has to be a specific individual uh, who needs to own the project um, and the team uh, and identifying the ex the need for expertise uh, you know it's a it, Overall, when it comes to pitfalls, things like these, I'd say a, a good place to look at is, um, you know, the 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 program. Uh, so there was a program, Smart Grid Investment Grant, uh, um, you know, funded um, by the DOE, the Department of Energy under Obama administration. That program finished, I think, around 2016, 2017. And there were, uh, um, you know, a number of reports uh, that were provided. Um, and, and, you know, in the final report, the DOE has actually um, accumulated the lessons learned and categorized them into eight different categories, the pitfalls uh, that uh, the various uh, stakeholders, um, you know, fell into uh, when they were uh, doing these projects. So I'd say that's a good place to start because it's very similar infrastructure a lot of it was smart metering uh, you know so building these communication infrastructure uh, a very similar concept uh, that i believe is a very good start it's a, the final report is available on doe's website um, if you want the link you know uh, approach me and i'll i'll share the link with you that report has has a very detailed you know sort of over the seven years there were a hundred projects 238 utilities and all the pitfalls that they experience in those projects are listed there. Uh, so it's a good place to start with, uh, you know, when you're doing your planning for these projects. Sounds like a good resource. Steve, what, what, what do you see as pitfalls that people run into? Uh, I, I don't want to keep hammering the planning thing, but planning is really, really important. Seems um, to be the theme. Yeah. Um, I think the, the only, I think the additive piece that I would bring to the table is, you know, don't, don't be afraid to invest in technology and automation to help manage the ongoing process, not only in to, to determine or identify the right data up front, but think about looking at things like a place to store and have a system of record for line of sight data for parcel and building level, um, um, uh, boundary layers and all this information is going to be super important for you to manage. But it's not a one-time thing. You you need to have the ongoing persistence in terms of how you're managing that asset. And I would say, don't be afraid to invest in the technology and automation to support it. Okay, Frank. Uh, yeah. So re ref as reflecting on uh, the broadband projects over the last. Uh, uh, decades, you know, some some things that jump out at me and that were sort of mentioned by the panel. Uh, again, Phil, Phil, I think one is to un make sure you you understand uh, any gaps that you might have in your technical or operational model, especially if your core business is not telecom deployment or operations. Bring in partners uh, who can fill the fill gaps. Another thing is be sure to focus on engineering and permitting in your project up front. One or two missed permits can cause significant cost or, or milestone delays, especially for example, if you're building a fiber extension or ring out to a, a rural area that's gonna be you know, served with a, a wireless distribution. And then, and then similar to the more recent comments with you know, about automation and, and technology, you know, begin. You know, begin with the end in mind. Have the right tools, processes, and um, you know, uh, for to measure progress in a timely fashion. You know, you don't wait. You know, a month before your uh, SOC hub reports due, right? To understand, you might have some risks <laughs> and, and deployment challenges, right? Have all have as much of that automated with leading indicators and risk management uh, programs in place as, as head of ahead of time so that um, you know, you're, you're well ahead of, of schedule and, and managing risk along the way. Yeah, Scott, if one's yours. 
Yeah, thanks. I, so I, I, I think the obviously the planning and the execution risks that have been identified here are clearly important. But there's a couple things that I that I like to point out that I think are even bigger risks when you have this wonderful government funding available. And I'll start with saying we as as folks who live and work in the United States should be very, very thankful that RDOF exists. We should also be thankful that the proposed programs and the existing programs through the American Recovery Act and the American Jobs Act uh, are potential additional public funding dollars to support and partner with those private funding dollars that are available out there to, to meet the demand for that broadband infrastructure. But at the same time, if we look back at historical projects and those similar government funding sources, they can create other problems. You can build in an area that isn't built purely because it just didn't have the, the, the commercial demand to justify an individual infrastructure um, expenditure. And while the government funding can help that, it doesn't change the math. And in fact, it can create the opportunity to make the math worse by raising the cost of raw materials, as, as Rob pointed out, um, at least in the short term, as you increase demand for, you know, right now, just, just getting the core materials to put in duct is is getting more expensive and it's getting more delayed. Um, the cost of labor continues to go up. There's a good side to that, right? We're, we're increasing the overall uh, payable jobs out there, but there's a difficulty because you can't deploy if you can't find affordable labor to be able to deploy in those markets. And so it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, but but one of the solutions to that, and the reason that we at, at, at Vivac and EX Squared are so focused on shared infrastructure and open access model is, historically, we have built similar infrastructure along the exact same corridors to fill the needs of two different parallel customers that just weren't willing or able uh, to work together. And we think in, a, in a particular, as you start to get into these tier two and tier three markets, what using that shared infrastructure makes it more cost effective. It makes it more time effective. It, it re preserves the scarce resource of the right of way that's available. It reduces operating costs and ultimately provides a better solution for everybody involved, uh, both today and through the entire operational life of the facilities that's being deployed. So I think the coordination of those and being willing to partner with others is a way to avoid that fall that, that can unintentionally be created by the influx of incremental federal dollars. All right. Well, thank you. And uh, I think we are out of time here. So I'm going to turn it over to Jamie. Jamie. Yeah, we are. We are. So much uh, love, though, insight. Uh, great, great uh, words of, of wisdom there. Thank you, gentlemen. Big thank you, of course, to my friend, our guest moderator, Rob Powell, founder and chief editor of Telecom Ramblings, keeping us on point as usual. And again, our insightful speaker, Rob Custer, Consolidated Communications, Scott Bergs, EX Square Technology, Frank DeJoy, Render Networks, Ishak Mian, Redline Communications, and Steve Levitt, Connected to Fiber. Really great tips and insight. Also, I noticed some of it's my friend, Leon Markham from Highland. We see your great questions. We will get them in front of our speakers and get you responses by email. Thank you for, for writing those in. And if you were one of our first 100 registrants, we hope you enjoyed your lunch. Make sure you visit us at jsa.net to register for more upcoming JSA virtual roundtables, including our next one, which is on May 20th, where leaders in our industry were going to talk about disaster recovery and network resiliency right in time for hurricane season. So uh, that is a wrap here. Look out for the playback of today's roundtable coming soon to JSA TV and JSA podcasts on YouTube, iHeart, iTunes, Spotify, many more. In the meantime, see you back in the networking lounge. And as always, stay safe and happy networking.